loved about this film is that it starts cozy and then it gets chilling. <laughs> and that is not an easy uh, bridge to cross. And uh, what we have here is a really innovative story that has so many of the pleasures of holiday films we like, but then takes a left turn into some place even more interesting. It is the debut feature from a filmmaker I suspect you will be seeing and hearing a lot more from. She's come to introduce the film to you tonight. Please join me in welcoming the writer and director of Silent Night, Camille Griffin. because I googled it when you extraordinarily invited us to your festival, so thank you Cameron. Thank you so much for having a silent night here. Um, fortunately, I have Lily Rose with me and, um, and Trudy Suller, our producer and actress, and I, I must say that we're going to do a Q&A afterwards, I think. And if you would like to listen to me talking nonsense, uh, please do stick around for that. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am because I haven't seen the film with an audience. I've only seen the film in the sound, uh, the sound mix and then the grade. So I'm going to be listening to your every reaction. And, and I really hope um, that you enjoy the film. But I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but it does mean an awful lot to me that you've taken the time and energy to be here and to support cinema and to support us. So thank you tremendously. And let me introduce you to Trudy. Trudy Woody. This is Trudy. TIFF audience, um, it's so lovely to be back. God, I love this festival and we're just so honoured to be here. Um, I'm not going to speak very much because Cammy and me are going to do a Q&A at the end, but on behalf of Marv, uh, Matthew Vaughan and my beloved partner Celine Rattray of Maven Pictures, our, our, our company, we're absolutely thrilled. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, back to you, Cammy. Lily, Lily Rose! was supposed to say but I hope you enjoy the film and thank you and um, look forward to talking with you afterwards. Join me in welcoming the writer and director of Silent Night, Camille Griffin, and the producer Trudy Stiles. start by asking just how you came up with the, the premise. I think how I came up with it is maybe a little bit more disturbing than the film itself, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, my children had watched uh, War Horse, and it asked me that question, what, what's going to happen to us if, um, if there's another war? And I said, well, I think it's kind of worrying, because I think it's going to be a much worse war, you know. Um, but it's okay, because I've saved up my tram doll from my operation. <laughs> and <laughs> and made some water. I said, we can't go out in the woods and kill things and kill each other and have to eat each other. So I said, we'll just have a nice dinner and curl up and have a cuddle. They went, we're not fucking doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, that's it, that should be the film, you know. Let's see. And I think, I think um, Kira said it really beautifully today when we were doing press. She said that when you give birth as a parent, you also give, give birth to fear. And uh, I was like, she should actually be writing this bit. But it's true, I think, as a parent, you are, I know you're a parent yourself, that um, there's a terrible responsibility of how do you keep your children safe and how do you um, allow them to have a, you know, independence growing up and, to, and experience the world as they should and then the point of when you try and protect them. But it, for years I've just had this anxiety, how am I going to protect my children? And actually, strangely enough, having made this film, I don't 
have the same anxiety. <laughs> Just take them with you. Yeah, yeah, well, I don't know about that, but it's like, well, you kind of face your worst fear. It's awful seeing them up there. Um, yeah, so I don't know if, if, if a, a psychoanalyst would call me, like, you know, psychopathic, I don't know, but I think it's important that we have these conversations um, with our children when they're ready to have them with us, you know. Not about suicide, but about the planet and the environment and caring about one another and, and the rest of society. That's the, the film is a metaphor, it's not supposed to be a suicide movie, it's supposed to be a satirical expression of the privileged classes and how they could, we could do better. Nicely done. Okay. <laughs> um, Trudy, how did you get involved with, with this project? And how did the two of you work together on putting together this incredible cast? Um, well, um, I got a call from Matthew Vaughan, uh, who uh, I worked with when we produced Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch, which was in 1986. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Matthew and Guy have done rather well since then. And uh, so he said, there's, there's this uh, extraordinary script written by an extraordinary woman, and uh, I'd like you to take the lead on set and be with her every day and support her. And uh, I read the script and I was just in. Uh, and uh, so Maven, uh, Celine Rattray and my company uh, were the on-set producers. And, uh, and we found a house in Hertfordshire uh, to shoot the movie in, and we didn't leave Cammy's side. And it was during the pandemic, which was sort of like, you know, like uh, art, art, life imitating art, really. This sort of film started to become more and more loaded as the pandemic grew. And um, I live primarily in New York, and uh, the ICU numbers were just sort of filling up and that whole thing was becoming really scary and should we go on shooting or should we not? And, uh, you know, our cast and crew were so committed to trying to finish the film and Boris Johnson would not lock the country down. So this small film with, you know, very small uh, dollars, uh, we didn't want to call uh, on... Um, uh, we, we couldn't call force majeure because he hadn't locked the country down and uh, Kira very bravely soldiered on and was checking in with her uh, all the time, you know, like, are you guys okay? And I was bringing in uh, hand sanitizers from New York because you can get enough in England. I don't know what that tells us about England and the hand sanitizers, by the way, <laughs> but uh, not... Uh, we tried to keep the set as hygienic as possible, um, and I, I think that we got a very, very lucky break because not one of us got ill. Uh, and um, yeah, we shot the movie in 23 days, I want to say. A lot less than that. 22. That, that's the producer's fancy, that they gave us more time than they gave us. <laughs> I think it was, it was 22 or 23 days, and then we had to do a... Uh, we, call, we called it and said, okay, we can't finish it now. So we came back in September and, and finished the, uh, some, the last scenes. So that's how I got involved. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's really so lovely to see not just Kira, but Matthew and Lucy and Lily and all of these remarkable actors playing essentially an ensemble. I mean, many of them have led films of their own, but they really work so well together. Was that hard to do? I don't. I think we were blessed, weren't we? I don't know how it happened. I think Matthew is very rigorous about every decision we make. He's he's a he's a great mentor because he doesn't say yes very often, um, which I think is a good thing, really enough. <laughs> so we kept pushing to find the right cast, and our cast were incredible. And I don't know what it was, but the, I think essentially when an actor says yes to that kind of material, sorry, um, you right, thank you. You realise that they. They're on the same page as you, whether it's I don't know, spiritually, politically, or socially, or something. And I think already we were halfway there that they suggested the material. And then on set, they were just, they were fun, and they were uh, really engaged in each other, and, and, and in the script, and in us, and in me, and in and my children, and in the crew. I mean, I was really, I mean, blessed, and it was, it was easy. I'm sorry to say that. I think that it was, that was, that was easy. I think the hardest bit was, 
Was it the shoe? The shoe was, it was obviously like um, Trudy said, the pandemic was growing and it was a little bit like, oh, hang on, actually, it is in Europe now. Oh, it is in the UK. And, and then we had this huge sense of responsibility to protect the crew and the cast and get the film shot. But the, the shoot was a bit of a dream, for me anyway, because they were phenomenal and they weren't competitive. And I think, and what Kira had, <clears throat> which I hadn't anticipated, is she has this incredible piece about her, doesn't she? And, and she knows to be, but if they're all chattering around the dinner table scene, as we're moving the camera in between setups, she always knew when to be quiet and to stop, and then suddenly everyone followed suit. So she was like, she was like the lighthouse in the in the um, in the production. She was she had this calming, centered energy that was, I mean, professional. I suppose you just call it professional, but it was quite profound. And I looked at Kira and like, 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 oh, I need to tell her to shut the fuck up. And she'd like, she'd go quiet, and then within seconds, she, everyone else would follow suit. Yeah. Um. I want to hear from you as well, so if you've got questions, prepare them, please. The last thing I want to ask is about the tone of the okay. film, which is, I imagine, very hard to get, and in, in the screenwriting process, on set as you're directing your actors, in the edit suite, at every level, you must be finding that exact balance between the tragedy and the comedy, the, the big picture, the little moments. How, how did you do that? Well, I don't, I mean, I think, I think we've achieved the tone. I think you'll say we have achieved the tone, so I hope that's You have it. achieved the tone. Okay, good, okay, all right. Let's, let's just go, let's pretend we've achieved the tone. Mm -hmm. I think, um, well, it was interesting because I was watching the second act, obviously, now I haven't seen the film for a long time. Like I said, I haven't seen it with an audience. And you were brilliant. You got exactly what I wanted you to laugh. And I don't know about the last five minutes because we had to come from here to here. But thank you for laughing exactly when I wanted you to laugh. Um, but um, we did balance it, you know, there'd be a funny scene and then there'd be a sad scene and there'd be a funny scene and a sad scene. And it, it felt a bit obvious, but it kind of worked. And then I think the Coca-Cola scene, where, like everyone was laughing with the Cokes and the kids. And I mean, that is how ludicrous life is, isn't it? And um, when you want to behave and be serious, and we used to go to church on Christmas Eve because if we went to church on Christmas Eve, we would we'd be allowed to open our presents. I mean, and we could never keep a straight face in church on because we because we were kids. It was like we're in church. This is hilarious. But I mean, the point is, when you're told to behave, I don't know how anyone else is, but I'm kind of naughty and I don't know how to behave. So that no, makes me want to misbehave. Um, so if you can make a film about everyone misbehaving. But really, it's the, 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 you know, I sound posh. I've got a posh British voice, but posh people are ridiculous. We're ridiculous. And, and no one says that, you know, in England. No one says that we're ridiculous because, you know, they're the government, they run, they make all the rules. Well, actually, they're kind of ridiculous. So it's nice to see, I think, even though I've written it, it's nice to see a film about posh people as they really are, which is daft and stupid and ignorant. <laughs> but, but also loving and funny and, you know, that, that meant something to me. And the British didn't want to make my movies, and it wasn't thanks to Trudy and to Matthew, and thanks to you for inviting our film here. I, I don't know if anyone will see this film. <laughs> because the Brits are a bit like, shut up, you know, we're not that bad. Um, you know, You're funny. So. But I think, I think Cammy has a unique voice in, um, in, in cinema, um, and I'm so really proud to have worked with her. She was fearless on set. She absolutely had planned what, how this movie was to be, uh, in what tone, and it is a difficult tone. But it, and Kami, I think this is your uniqueness as a filmmaker, and I've seen you know the new scripts that we're working on of yours, and she's just is so ballsy, and, so, and but is she, there, there are no out and out villains uh, in, in her movies, she sees human beings on, for their frailties and their failings, but there's a lot of, like, she has a lot of empathy for all of them, and, and, and it's absolutely evident in Silent Night, so just to say I'm so proud to be working with you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. I'm lucky. Thank you. Thank you. The question is, do you have a favourite or least favourite scene? <clears throat> I have a favourite line, I have to admit that, which is my Diana line, and I'm really grateful that you guys got that. And, um, yeah, and we almost lost that line, didn't we? At one point, that, that line came out of the head, and I was like, oh, not the Diana line, I've got to go back in. Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I loved Lady Diana. She, I was, and my mother's French, and she was convinced she'd been killed. Um, but yes, uh, favourite scene. I do love the stair scene, and I do love the Coca-Cola scene. 
And I, I, I call it the reminiscing scene where with the scrabble board and the really appalling behaviour and I, I, I kind of love that scene. Yeah, the audience seem to love that, that yeah. scene too. I think, yeah. Trudy, do you? Favourite scene? Oh God, there's so many favourite scenes. I think, I think um, well I want to pay a, a bit of homage to uh, your kids, and particularly to Roman. Uh, this gravitas that uh, that he has when he is uh, when the big reveal at the dinner party scene, uh, and he just you know he takes the adults down uh, with this face that is both innocent and um, wise at the same time that he just will not brook any lies and any stupidity. He, he I think he really ta takes centre stage there and. Uh, he's, a, he's, he's a brilliant actor, uh, and we we loved working with him. And, Cam, and Cammy is a, a, a tough taskmaster on her kids. She really uh, she was quite strict with them, so it's very funny to see that she's effing and blinding all day long. But she was, you know that when she's with the kids, that they were um, they all came with their lines, and they were you know they they were very professional and. Uh, and so I think that that scene, the, the dinner table, see the, the Christmas lunch scene the, and the big reveal is really great because it's the audience, it's the grown-ups that are sort of like made to look like Charlie's and the, the kids are trying to take the lead as of course they're going to with the pickle that we're in, with the way the world is, with the, uh, with the environment. Thank you. That I haven't seen, I'm afraid. <laughs> but I have a love, and I love a Hannah Melancholy. 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 Melancholy, which is so utterly depressing, but kind of brilliant. Um, and, and I love anything that Hanukkah does. But in terms of the end of the world movies... There was one shot in Toronto called Last Night. I don't know if you know that. Oh, yeah. I, I've, I've actually, I've watched the trailer because people refer to Last Night. Yeah, and I think, I, I'm not young by any means, but I think I was a little bit young when that. Yeah, that's you, from the 90s. Yeah. Um, so I should watch Last Night. Very different. Yeah, now that you've made yours, you can watch yes, them. Yes, <laughs> Not before. yes. Not uh, The first comment was um, that Tiff had written, I thought actually quite, uh, I was quite grateful for it, but um, you were a little bit disappointed to know so much about the story before watching the film. Okay, so I'll answer that first. I think fundamentally when I wrote the script, when we, when we shot the film, uh, we had no idea that, um, that COVID was going to come into our lives. and fundamentally aware that people have suffered and, and suffered much more than we can, I can imagine. I mean, I have, I'm saying I've, I've had it easy, right? And I know a lot of people haven't. And I was grateful because Matthew had, Matthew Vaughan had kind of, when I say threatened, it's a joke, but teased me at the beginning that he wanted it to be, to trick people, the audiences into some one thing that they were watching a working title type film. And as soon as COVID came, we thought we can't do that. It's not, it, people need, they need trigger warnings all over Instagram now. People are like, put a trigger warning, put a trigger. So I was so grateful that, I don't know who wrote the synopsis on your website, but it was beautifully done. And it was such a relief for me because I thought, I now don't have to be guilty of tricking an audience into being traumatized. So I think it's important because yes, you're right. Those great lines are lost to a degree, but who cares? Because fundamentally, I think it's more important that people uh, are prepared to what they're going to watch. And then there's, um, okay, thank you. And then the second um, question um, about the vaccine. Okay, so <clears throat> I bring my children up to challenge the system, not to be re rebels, but to question things, you know, like in England, the British love queuing. I don't know if you use the word queuing yeah, yeah. over here. They say queue, they'll join it. Why is everyone in the same room queue? But, so I try, I'm trying to bring my children up to not just join queues and be sheep. Um, and, and unfortunately, in, in our education system as well, you know, you have to look out for yourself. So I meant it when I wrote those lines, like, do you, you know, do teachers get it wrong? Of course they get it wrong. Do scientists get it wrong? Okay, that's another thing, which we're going to come to in a sec. Do the government get it wrong? Yes, they get it fucking wrong. But the vaccine for me is very, very important because the conversation didn't exist at that point. I am pro the vaccine. I, I'm double vaccinated. And I believe that for me, the vaccine is a way forward and it's a hope for society. And fundamentally, 
I took the vaccine, not because I wanted to put anything foreign in my body, but because I want to protect other people, and I don't want to be responsible for spreading germs and for killing anyone. So, <clears throat> fundamentally, you take the vaccine because society, you care more about other people than yourself. Right? Do you care about the greater good? That's why we take the vaccine. Not because we want needles in our arms, right? And, and I cannot bear that people won't be vaccinated. I can't bear it. So for me, the vaccine is a way forward and a way out. And the pill, sorry, the vaccine is a way forward. The exit pill, as in Brexit, and our government took us out of Europe, um, <laughs> which I'm also very upset about. Um, but the exit pill is a way out. There is no way forward. It's an escape. It's to avoid suffering. Now, we've all learned in the last year, and I I'll shut up in a minute, that <clears throat> we can't avoid suffering. It's, uh, some people can, have, like I said, have an easier time than others, but suffering is unfortunately unavoidable for an awful lot of people. So the boy has courage, and I think the point of the film is he's saying, I'm prepared to suffer for the greater good. And, and I think we should all be prepared to suffer for something bigger than ourselves. And really, I hope that comes through in the film, with all the silliness and the Coca-Colas and the suicides and the pills and the stabbing, the grotesque stabbing. Um, <laughs> but that's really, I'm pro-vaccine, and it's unfortunate that that will be potentially misconstrued or, or questioned. So I'm grateful you asked it, because now I've been able to say it in front of you all. So thank you for asking. Can you remind me, were you thinking of this being a standalone movie, or is there a sequel coming? Well, I, I did write a, a, a treatment for a sequel, but unfortunately, more people died in this story than I, I originally intended. <laughs> Once you got started. Um, and um, not to go through, you know, the, the different uh, interviews, but I, I thought there could have been a... There was an alternate ending for Sophie, <laughs> where she might not have died, and I thought, let's leave art someone to maybe make him a, an egg on toast, you know, poor kid, he's going on, on his own. So, um, yes, I definitely did hope that there might be an, uh, a possibility of a sequel, which would have been great fun, because there's such a great cast, but no, they're all bloody dead, apart from him. I'm sorry. There's no, it's awful, isn't it? Sad. The chicken, we tried to save the chicken. Yeah, we, we had one permutation <laughs> with Belinda survived. Belinda the chicken uh, survived, and then maybe Art coming out of the house and seeing Belinda, but then it's like, well, he's going to be hungry, so Bel Belinda will be left. <laughs> <laughs> None of it worked, so I think the sort of like cami script has all, uh, was always um, Art opening his eyes uh, at the end, and I just think that that's the clarion call for wake up, everybody. Well, I would love to see a sequel, so I hope we can find a way to do that. Um, I want to just ask you to please join me in thanking again for Skyler, my producer, Jesus, Andy Skyler, and the writer and director, Camille Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Hey, this is Eric from MyOnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.